All right. If I say go to the last book of the Old Testament, do you know which book it is? This means yes, this means no. Well, Steve's giving you a cheat oh, sheet here. Go to the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. <clears throat> There are six six verses that use this phrase today that I'm going to give to you. A word that I'm sure that you didn't use this week. Wherein? Anybody use that word? Sounds kind of, I don't know. We just don't talk that way. But in this King James, again, if you've got another translation, I'm sorry that you're lost, but... Uh, King James is where we stay. Guy asked me if we'd uh, uh, met him down there at State Track meet yesterday. We were walking through the mall, and he said, I came to go to the Christian bookstore. I said, well, you're about two, three years late. They already closed that. Most bookstores are closing because you get it online and those, those ways, and uh, it, it's not the same. But he said, I wanted to get an amplified Bible. He said, you ever used one of them? I said, no, I said, never will either. I said, if I need a commentary, I said, I go to Matthew Henry, but I said, it's King James where I've been and where I'll stay till the day I die. So somebody said, why? Why won't you change? Why won't you use one of these modern translations? I get too much out of the old one. Why would I want to go to something new when I'm still getting fed out of this book? And I, somebody said, well, you must be one of them 1611 trans, uh, King James people. I said, no, I've seen the 1611 uh, out there at seminary. I can't even read that thing. So you talk about some of these words might be bad for you. You ought to see those. They don't spell the same way in 1611 as they do in here. Of course, I don't talk the same way in my West Virginia slang as what they do either. So I'm sure I use some words that aren't the same as what they have. But this one I know that there are, are six times in the book of Malachi that this word, wherein, is used. And it speaks. Because it's a question that's posed by God from him to us. Wherein are you doing this? Why are you doing this in other words? And that's what I want you to get today. So in chapter 1, verse 1, or verse 2, verse 6, and verse 7, in chapter 2, verse 17, I'll go over this again, but I know you're taking notes, so I want you to get it all. In chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, six times wherein is used that God is asking a question of us, and we got to have an answer. Don't you like that? If I say a rhetorical question, I ask a question, but I'm not expecting an answer, and I'm prompting you for an answer. <coughs> If I ask the kids, I ask you a question, I am demanding an answer, aren't I? So God is asking a question, and it's not rhetorical. He wants you to answer this. Children of Israel, you're talking about 400 B.C., 400 years before Christ. From 400, if you, again, my good Thompson chain, this page here that separates Old Testament from New Testament, all the books in the New Testament, 400 years of silence. There wasn't a prophetic voice. There wasn't a prophet to come along. There was nobody. The next person that would come along would be John the Baptist. And again, John came preaching one word. What was it? Repent. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's the last prophecy in, in Malachi chapter 4. But starting here now in chapter 1 of Malachi, verse 2, verse 6, verse 7, I'm going to read all six verses, and then I'll come back and we'll deal with each of them separately. Verse 2, I have heard you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob. Verse 3, but I hated Esau. And I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of this wilderness. Verse 6, verse 7. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I then be a father, where is my honor? 
And if I be a master, where is my fear, saith the Lord of hosts unto you? O priests that despise my name, and you say, Wherein have we despised your name? You offer polluted bread upon my altar, and you say, Wherein have we polluted you? And that you say, The table of the Lord is contemptible. Chapter 2, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, Wherein have we wearied him? When you say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or where is the God of judgment? Chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from my ordinances, and you have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Blessed Father, we thank you for this small book, the close of the Old Testament. And yet, Father, we know that you are bringing the things of darkness to light. Because again, you're calling your children to answer. Calling them into an account about where they're at and what they're doing. And why they're doing it. And Father, so often your people question you. And here are his six questions being questioned unto you. And every time you have an answer, Lord. I thank you that you know all things. I thank you that you have all the answers. Father, again, that we would never, ever presume to answer for you where you have not spoken. So, Lord, again, would you teach us this day? Would you bring to our remembrance your ways, the things that are right and things that are good in your sight? It would not allow for us to question this wherein, the things that are happening, but that we know, we understand, because you've given us a word to study to show ourselves approved. You've given us the Holy Spirit that brings it to mind, brings it to remembrance, teaches us. Brings all things for your honor and your glory. Help us this day, Lord. May we have ears to hear. May we have a mind to understand. May we have hearts to receive. And souls to be impacted, Father, for your kingdom. Be glorified and honored, Lord, because it's your word. In Jesus' name I pray and I ask. Amen. I want to take uh, some of these. I'm going to spend a little bit longer time. But some of these just to address <laughs> The question here, in, in chapter 1 of Malachi, we start with the first one, verse 2 and 3. These go together. These two verses go together, by the way. There are sections in Malachi that he breaks down when he's asking or allowing for these questions to be presented in this. So the first one is, he said, wherein have you loved us? Here's God's people questioning him about his love. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And the first question that most people says, what? God hates? God, why would God hate Esau? Well, we're going to get to this in a little bit more depth over in chapter 2, verse 17. But the answer, automatic answer that we ought to know, why would God ever hate anybody in the midst of this? And some fool out here that doesn't know the word of God says, but God loves everybody. That's not what it says, is it? It says he hated Esau. Why? Because he sold his birthright. He gave up his blessing because Jacob had fooled him on that. And here's this scoundrel, Jacob, who stole from his own brother for a bowl of soup. Must have had, some, must have had a thing of vinegar in that, hadn't it? Must have had some ramps in that bowl of soup there. So, mmm, boy. Old uh, Andy Griffith would say, mmm, boy. But he says he gave that up because, Jacob, I have loved you. Even when you was a scoundrel, even when you was a liar, even when you was cheating your brother, I loved you. Esau, I could never love you. Why? Because God knows the heart and the intent of people that says, my eyes are fixed on the heavens and I love the Lord my God. I said it in the Sunday school hour. It seems like common sense to us. God reached down. God convicted me. God saved me. He claimed me. He made me one of his. He loved me. I received that love. I loved that love that God had for me because I was in sin. I was in desperation. I was on my way to hell. And God reached down and rescued me. And here is God's people saying, Wherein have you loved us? What? God loved 
loves me. God loves us. There's a world out there that doesn't understand this, that doesn't appreciate this. They don't care about this. They're more interested whether someone else loves them. They need attention from someone else. Or they're in love with the, their sports team. Or they're in love with this item or that item. They, they've got their eyes and their focus on the wrong thing. And they never had in their minds today the thought, wherein has he loved me? Well, this is a very key central thing here because if you're not a part of the group that he loves, Jacob, his church, then you're on the other side. Esau, the ones that follow after Satan. You think God loves Satan? You think God loves those that are in hell today? All those that rejected him? All those that betrayed him? All those that forgot him? All those that abhorred him? He didn't love them because he knew that their hearts were evil. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Love, hate. He said, how does God hate anything that stands against him? He hates. So when our Congress and our Supreme Court and our judicial system pass things against him, don't think, don't say, well, God loves everybody. That's a, that's a blight of the scripture of understanding the completeness of this. God is complete of all these things. He's light, but he also dwells in the thick darkness. He's above, but he's also beneath. He is the paradox of all of these characteristics that we describe in this. But these people, his own people, are questioning him. Wherein have you loved us? And I know that there are people at times, difficult times. God, could God ever love me? Why would God ever love someone like me? I remember them talking about David Wilkerson up in the New York City Times Square Church where that guy drove the car in the, in the crowd, killed that girl and wounded about two dozen others this past week. He started a church right there in Times Square back in the 1980s, 1986, 87, somewhere around there. Ravenhill said he was in there doing chapel one service, and he said, uh, Mr. Ravenhill, can we, can we do our anthem before we get started? He said, anthem? He said, yeah, our, our, our national, our kind of, anthem song that we have. He said, you sing the Star Spangled Banner before church? He said, no, 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 not the national anthem, our anthem. And he said, well, he said it was a pure Puerto Rican man. He said, I just assumed he was going to sing the national anthem of Puerto Rico. And he said, all these gang members had come out of the gangs, killed people, stabbed people, shot people, wounded people. He said on this side was all the prostitutes, the high dollar prostitutes and all that. And he said, he said, I didn't have any idea what they were getting ready to sing. He said, and he said, I guess, go ahead. And he said, so they started to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And he said, when I looked around, he said, there wasn't one dry eye in the place. Wherein has he loved me? who sold my body to those that were on the streets, disease-ridden, killed people, murdered people, hurt people. How could he love me? Because he looked down and he knew the heart that says, I'll receive that gift. The hard heart, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The soul that says, will you quit talking to me about this? I've made up my mind. I don't care if I die and go to hell or not. Just leave me alone. God says, grant it. You hate me, I hate you. You return to me, I'll return to you. You love me, I'll show you what love is all about. Unconditional love in this. And he says the difference in the minds of people. Where and have we said, has he loved me? And again, if you ever want to know what it is of pure joy, pure appreciation, you sit there and answer that question. Why would God ever love someone like me? And if you come up with a reason is to say, well, I'm, I'm good enough. Well, I'm such the most perfect person around. Just ask me. I'll tell you. You have no idea what you're talking about. There is not one good thing in you or in me that God would ever love me. And the only thing that he ever saw in me was sin. And the only thing that he ever saw in you was evil. And he hates evil. 
He pours judgment out on evil. He has wrath against evil. But for some reason in grace and mercy he extends. And he says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. I am so grateful. I am so thankful that I'm not on the side of Esau. I'm on the side of Jacob. And it's because of him. Not me, him. He did it all. And here's his own people that brought him out of Egypt. Gave him David. Gave him the promised land. Fulfilled Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's promise. And they have the audacity to question him? I think today, if persecution comes to the American church, and it will, that they will do the same thing. Why would God ever do this to us? Why would God ever take away our freedoms, take away our rights, take away our opportunities in that? We would be in the same place as these people, questioning God. Where is this God of love? Where is this God that we have served all these years? And he said, you forgot me, I forgot you in the midst of that. So verse 2 and 3 is a paradox of love and hate. And the question that is presented there, wherein has thou loved us? Questioning God's love. Verse 6, 7. The first one there, he's a father. The man for honor from his children. He's a master. He deserves fear from his servants. And then the question that is posted there, wherein have we despised your name? Well, that's not a hard one, is it? I would imagine that I could send you for 30 minutes over to Romney and you would find in Sheets or McDonald's or one of those places someone that would dishonor his name. In other words, take the name of the Lord in vain. You said not everybody that speaks the name Jesus today is giving praise to him, are they? I even hear Christians do this. They use that little slang term, oh my God. You don't say that. Because again, you're not praying to the Lord. You're using a slang statement. It's not re referencing God. It's a slang comment. You're taking the name of the Lord in vain. I hear that out when people do that in this last generation. I don't know. I lost track of Generation X, Generation Baby Boomers, Generation Millennial. I don't even know what generation it is anymore. But this last generation used that word um, uh, of the descriptions of God, and they put it on everything else out there. So again, like we say, love. Oh, I I love the. Uh, Washington Wizards, or I love the this ball team, or I love pizza, Paul, I love McDonald's, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, they cheapen the word by doing that, don't they? So that they don't know what love really is in that. And now they go to this thing of saying, our God is an awesome God. Rich Mullins wrote that song back in the 70s or 80s, and then they cheapened that word, awesome, that everything now is awesome. There's only one thing that's awesome. There's only one thing that's holy. I grew up listening to Chicago Cubs WGN with old Harry Carey on the on the television. And every time that somebody would hit a home run, uh, he would be the one to say, holy cow. I never thought anything about it as a kid. You know, that was just a slang term. That was just something that he said. But then I started reading the Bible. There is none holy but God. And his name is holy. Over in Isaiah chapter 58, his name is holy. So that if we attribute holy to a cow or to anything else that's out there, and they use some pretty slang things with holy, all we're doing is cheapening his name. You speak his name with fear. The Lord God Jehovah. Father. Christ, Son, they can take it in vain. It doesn't mean anything to them, but it ought not be named out of our lips in an irreverent manner. You're my son, honor me. Where's my honor? You're my, I'm the master, you're the servant, fear me. And we've talked about that so often. Where's the fear of the Lord at today? Does this nation fear him? Do people tremble and quake? No, they will, but it'll be too late, won't it? So he says in this, he says, you have not done what is required of you in this. And then you have the audacity, O priest that despise my name. So he's coming to the priests, the preachers, the teachers. You haven't even reverend my name. That's the reason when I talk about wolves in sheep's clothing. 
They preach a false gospel. They don't even they get up and, you know, I remember that guy over at Kaiser, one of the Methodist churches over there. He would literally get up and read a Reader's Digest story for about 15 minutes. God bless you all. See you next week. And those people thought that that was what was actually a sermon. Don't you get any ideas? I can see some of you with the wheels are turning. A Reader's Digest story to replace the Word of God? My priests have despised my name. I would rather that you hear the truth. Make your choice about who you're going to serve and how you're going to serve than to never hear the truth and not have anything to respond to. Simply because it's done in another church or another preacher preached it. You know, it's like I told someone here recently. I said, I can't answer for all those things. They had 20 questions for me. I said, I can't answer. All I can tell you is what the book says. That's, just put that on my tombstone. That's, that's just what the book says. That's all that I want anymore. That King James, that boy, that's all he did was read that book, preach that book, teach that book, write on that book. What else is there? The grass withers, the flower fades, and they really fade when Georgie puts her green thumb to them. I mean, they die quick. Uh, she said, oh, I'm not going to let you cut these recent flowers. And she said, I'm telling you, I'm not going to let these die. I'm just waiting. I gave, I gave them three weeks. I don't think they'll make it that long. But I'll get you all a picture when, they, when they, I'm going to say, See, I told you so. You killed me, didn't you? Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God, what? Shall last forever. Why is this book important? Why is his name important? Because it's eternal. Things that are eternal are supposed to be important to us. They only live for today. What are you going to get into today? What did you do yesterday? What are we going to have for supper? That's just right here at the edge of your nose. That's all that this is. There's no views, all hail, the power of Jesus' name. That's eternal. You and I are getting ready for eternity with the Lord of, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. We're getting ready to sing praises to him forevermore. That's what we're here for. That's the only reason that we're here. It's not to make a million dollars. It's not to get your name in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's not for you to be popular. It's not because you wanted to do this or do that. You're here to get ready for eternity. Now, how many die without ever getting ready for eternity? And the rich man lifted up his eyes in torment in hell. What did he do? He squandered his life. He missed his opportunity. He thought it was about him. He thought it was about money. He thought it was about his life. And he forgot that this wasn't what it was about. You was given life to honor his name, to fear his name, to give presence to him. And you and I, once we understand that, are supposed to go tell them to get them ready. Because if you don't tell them, then you answer the question, who is going to tell them? Wherein have we despised your name by not living for him, by not speaking his name rightly, by not telling others about that great name? What's the greatest name in all the world? Jesus. Bill Gaither wrote that song. Jesus, Jesus, sweetest name I know. That little song, that's what it's all about. They speak it without honor. They speak it without fear. I speak it with love, fear, and respect. No other name given under men whereby they must be saved, but that name which is above all names, the name Jesus. You have Wherein have we despised your name? So that's the answer to that one. Verse 7. They've offered polluted bread upon my altar, and they say, Wherein have we polluted you? In that you say the table of the Lord is contemptible. Why don't I do communion as often as, as some churches do, where they do it the first Sunday of every month or quarterly or something? They do it just like they're doing everything else. They just go through the motions. They, con they bring contempt on the altar, contempt on the Lord's bread, the Lord's cup, because they don't remember. This do in remembrance of me. 
Sometimes they don't even think about it. They just do it. You ever do anything like that? Did you tie your shoes? You all got slip on. Huh? How many of you had to tie your shoes to get here? Did you think about it? Or did you just do it? You just do it, don't you? Most of the time, we, this is scary. We just jump in a vehicle and go. Just We don't even move. Just do it. What you're saying? We just go through motion. People say the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge. Of, I watch them do it all the time. I, I, I don't know how many times through all the sporting events with the kids and that. You don't realize how many times I hear the National the Star Spangled Banner song? Man, uh, 365 days in a year, I probably hear it 300 <coughs> times. You know how they just sing it? They just go through the motions of it. I listen. I contemplate on the phrases, on the statements. I'm praying for the nation as they're singing that song. But they just go through the motions of it. I've watched people do it in church. Take your hymn books and open. Sing a song. They just, nah, 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 nah. They sound like that teacher off of Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. They just go through the motions. There's no heart to them. What does God want? You, you made my altar. You've given me stale, moldy bread. You give me your leftovers. You do it in contempt. And yet you ask me the question, wherein have we polluted you? You don't think the church is polluted? We brought entertainment in here. We bring sales in here. And if you try to speak against these things that are in the churches today, well, everybody's doing it. Boy, well, it's okay. What's wrong with that? I know such, such a church, they're growing and they're doing it. Don't make it right. These things have polluted the, the house of God. My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And the American church is as guilty as this, as what the church in Jerusalem was when Jesus took a whip and drove them all out. You know, he'd do that today. He probably wouldn't even enter into most of the buildings uh, of the churches today because, again, they have polluted the house of God. Everything's about money. Keith Green back in the 60s and 70s, he got so convicted about making money off of the church, off of Christians, is that he said, I won't even charge you to come to my concerts. We just want to come and worship the Lord so they did it for free. You know who got mad about that? Other Christian artists that were making big bucks off of people coming and listening to them. Because they were now under the microscope saying, hey, Keith Green is not charging us anything. You're charging us $12, $15 a ticket to come listen. And why was they charging $12, $15 a ticket to come listen to Christian music about God? Because they had learned it from the world. You don't think that when the, the uh, Mel Gibson book, movie come out on the, um, on the crucifixion that he made a couple of years ago and made $100 billion off of, and Michael Cass and the first church down there in Georgia facing the giants and all you realize how much money they made off of the church? Because we have to sit and have popcorn and coke and sit back in our recliners? We want to be entertained. Entertainment pollutes the church because it's all about the flesh. It's not about the spirit. It's not about growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. It's about being entertained. And that's the mindset of the church people today. How can we be entertained? So they go get Jeremy the juggler. I always say that. That's not, that's not, I'm not just being facetious with that. That actually happened over her calf. Jeremy the juggler. You think Jesus would go in and applaud that? He would take a whip and cord in there to say, this is not what my house is about. You've polluted this. You've corrupted this. This is about me, not you. We enter into the house of the Lord on the day of the Lord, for the people of the Lord, with the word of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord. That's what it's all about. We polluted it. Confession? They never said they were sorry. They never humbled themselves. They never made the wrongs right. They just continued to do it. And that's why they sat for 400 years in silence. God finally said, we're done. We cut them off for 400 years. You realize how long that is, 400 years? Fairly long time, huh? 400 years in Egypt, 
400 years of silence, pattern. Now we're in chapter 2, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words, and yet you say, Wherein have we wearied him? When you say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them, or where is, where <coughs> is the God of judgment? Each one of these are a sermon in itself, but especially this one. Now this ties back to what I, what I was saying there earlier. You, you heard it pronounced. I've even said it at times and kicked myself afterwards about who God loves. Now again, we know John 3.16. For God did what? So loved the world. But again, John 